A monetary fund and some big countries say they back the global minimum corporate tax pushed by the Treasury Secretary. And Democrats' infrastructure plan gets a big boost today. Texas bans government-mandated vaccine passports. Why is the governor against them? And what does it mean for Texans? And a restaurant owner welcomes a burglar back to his establishment. Instead of jail time, he wants to offer help instead. That and much more coming up on NTD Business. President Biden and the Democrats are one step closer, a big step closer, to their $3 trillion infrastructure plan. A Senate parliamentarian says they can again use budget reconciliation to push the bill through without Republican support. This is a mechanism, as you know, reconciliation is a mechanism for passing uh, budgetary uh, bills in Congress. Democrats used the same mechanism to pass the last multi-trillion dollar stimulus. No Republicans backed it and was just added to the country's debt. But to pay for this bill, Democrats want to raise the corporate tax rate from 21 to 28 percent. That would make America less attractive for business investment. But to fix that, the Treasury Secretary wants every other country to set their corporate rate at a certain level, too. The International Monetary Fund said today it supports the plan. It says tax avoidance is a big problem for the world economy. Uh, It is a a big concern that we have a large amount of uh, tax shifting, tax avoidance, countries sending money to tax havens. Uh, And that's reducing the tax base uh, from which governments uh, can collect revenues. And And governments in Germany and France, big countries with already high tax rates, are naturally behind the idea. But you can be sure smaller countries that use lower tax rates to attract businesses aren't quite as excited. Countries like Ireland, who have a tax rate of 12.5%, will be very attractive. So you get companies like Apple... They buy a little a little place in uh, Ireland and call themselves an Irish company. And as a result, they don't pay American taxes. So she says, let everybody raise taxes uh, and this won't happen. Well, I say just the opposite. Let everybody lower taxes and then you, you wouldn't have this happening. Bring the tax rate in the U.S. down to 15 percent. Everybody would uh, come back. Uh, there's no advantage to be uh, not an American company, I think total revenue from corporate income tax would go up at the lower rate because you would see uh, that much more activity. So if you want to make the U.S. competitive, don't tell everybody else to raise the rates, bring our rates down. That's what will make us competitive. In 2017, Trump reduced the rate from 35 to 21 percent. He said it would encourage companies to invest more in the U.S., spur economic growth, He said the cuts would pay for themselves and even help the country pay off its debt. But Nobel laureate Paul Krugman says that never happened. And as a percentage of GDP, there was no bump in private investment in the years after the cut. Krugman is right. Business didn't increase investment by that much. In fact, he says what they did is they increased dividends to the stockholders and they bought back some shares of stock. That's true. But that's not a bad thing either. So the stockholders said to the corporations, we have all this extra retained earnings, but we don't have a lot of good investment opportunities. So instead of investing in things that may not be that good, some of the stockholders said, give us dividends or I'll sell some of my shares back, get that capital. I've got some investment opportunities. I can make 20, 30, 40, 50 percent if I bought Square stock. When they went public at $13, they're up to $250. So I have other investments. And what happened is corporations gave the money back to the stockholders. The stockholders had better um, investments. And although we didn't get quite the growth we'd hoped for, and we just need a little more time for that, the quality uh, went up significantly. The unemployment rate was down to record before the virus, down to a record low of three and a half percent, and real wages were going up. So that had very positive uh, effects, even if it wasn't the corporation investing directly. So there is a trickle down effect. I see some people on the other side of the argument who use it as a kind of negative, with a negative connotation. You feel that there is a trickle down effect. Absolutely. Look what happened in 1982. Congress lowered the the top tax bracket all the way down to 28 
percent. That set off an economic expansion that lasted 25 years. Had a little hiccup in 91, a little hiccup in 2001, but really from 1982 to 2007, we had an expansionary uh, period uh, where there was good economic uh, growth. Um, the standard of living uh, went up, and for everybody, the unemployment rate went down, wages were starting to uh, finally go up. So once corporations have capital to invest, the investments are made. Once the investments are made, the economy grows. We need workers. Uh, that creates more opportunity for everyone. I think trickle-down economics works perfectly every time. Stock buybacks and dividends are for the big guys. But what about the small businesses that'll get hit with that 7% corporate tax increase? Kerry Smith sold his small manufacturing business for $500 million back in 2017. Now he invests in new ventures. Ask them how smaller businesses will absorb the added expense. Well, every company is different. And, and uh, from my perspective, uh, as uh, on the smaller uh, for smaller businesses, taxes are it's a redistribution uh, from the private sector to the uh, government. And I know uh, the the problem with taxes is it takes money that you would spend to in in our case to grow the business. So whether it's hiring uh, more employees, whether it's uh, investing more in terms of engineering or marketing um, for a product, it certainly affects that and it affects it in a negative way because you're taking money out of the, the small business and, and as I say, you're giving it to the government. The thing about taxes, they typically, it's said, especially with larger uh, corporations, that those corporations simply pass the taxes on to the consumer, and I think that probably is true. The problem when you're running a small company, it's very, very difficult. Uh, it's necessary, but it's very difficult to raise your prices uh, because you have imperfect knowledge as to uh, who your competitors are. You have imperfect knowledge as to the motivations of your uh, customers, and so it's very hard to raise to to raise uh, uh, prices. Consequently, the taxes really do come out of the pocket of the business, and they really do have a, a negative impact. And so, for a smaller business, how do you go about planning if you know, okay, next year or two years down the line, we're going to have an extra seven percent um, in taxes? How, how do you go about uh, preparing for that? Well, to be honest with you, from a small business's perspective, there's not, again, there's not that much focus, there's not that much resolution, uh, that 7% uh, increase uh, would have. You simply have to look at it, you have to recognize, because you're, you're very optimistic when you're a business person, especially a small business person you imagine that you can overcome anything. You imagine that um, you can overcome that sort of thing. But but honestly, I think in that situation, 7% is quite, is, is, is quite a large increase. Uh, and consequently, one would have to either plan uh, to raise prices. I think you would almost have to in that case. That would be a, a, a very, uh, a very plain, a very, bold statement um, because that would, oh, 7%, that's a lot. I mean, it really is a lot. And uh, I don't think that people recognize, they imagine always that uh, a business is making a lot of money or that people within the business are making money because they simply don't understand uh, too much about business. There's also the issue of economic freedom that comes with increased and blanket taxes like the Treasury Secretary and the IMF are pushing. Whatever happened to free market system and competition for the benefit of the consumer? Daniel Akaya wrote the book Freedom or Equality that looks at the trade-offs between the pursuit of equality of outcome and our liberties. In this case, we'd have a global egalitarian tax policy. 
Lakai is also the chief economist at the Chess's hedge fund that has $6 billion of assets under its management. Asked him what freedoms, if any, will have to trade for this policy. Well, the first one, obviously, is the sovereignty of so many countries in terms of attracting capital and attracting investment. Taxation is a tool, is what, a fiscal policy is one of the main tools that a government has to uh, uh, promote prosperity and generate uh, growth and jobs in a country. The second one is obviously that we are the, these uh, bureaucrats are talking about a minimum corporate income tax rate, but they're not talking about a maximum government size, which is what they should actually be starting to talk about, because uh, little by little, government spending takes more and more of the GDP of a country each year, and they constantly blame the problems of the economy on the productive economy, that uh, saying that it doesn't pay enough taxes, instead of talking about the growing size of the unproductive and administrative bureaucratic part of the economy. So I think that, uh, obviously, it is just another stepping stone in trying to uh, extract a lot more wealth from the productive economy to give it to the unproductive part of the economy. And apart from backing the new global tax idea, the IMF says the U.S. economy is on track to grow at its fastest pace since 1984. IMF expects economic growth to reach 6.4% this year. That's a percentage point more than the group's forecast in January. IMF points to President Biden's nearly $2 trillion stimulus package as an economic boost for the nation. The financial group says it's already seeing signs the U.S. recovery is gaining speed. Last month, the U.S. saw its biggest jobs gain since August, and an economic indicator for manufacturing in the U.S. recently posted its best reading since 1983. Over in Texas, Governor Greg Abbott is banning government-mandated vaccine passports. He just signed an executive order about it Monday. Government should not require any Texan to show proof of vaccination and reveal private health information just to go about their daily lives. That is why I- Abbott says the state will continue its vaccination program without treading on personal freedoms. He said the state will soon surpass 13 million vaccine doses. Abbott's move follows a similar order by Florida Governor Ron DeSantos, also a Republican who cited privacy concerns. So-called vaccine passport system have been proposed in several countries and some airlines have also considered the idea. New York State started rolling out its own version, but it's reportedly full of errors. On Wall Street, stocks ended lower today, but the S&P 500 is still near record closing highs. The Dow fell 97 points, 0.29 percent. S&P 500 lost 4 points of 0.1 percent. The Nasdaq dropped 7 points of 0.05 percent. U.S. job openings rose in February to a two-year high, while hiring also picked up. Good sign. Another earnings season coming up as well. Investors waiting to see how strong the results will be. Refinitiv estimates S&P 500 growth of 24% from a year earlier. Just shows you. Snap owner Snapchat's up over 5% after an upgrade. Norwegian Cruise Line added nearly 5% as well. Company says it'll restart some trips after a year-long hiatus. Gold also up about 1%. Oil also up about 1%. Remember the investment fund that got liquidated a couple of weeks ago, Arkegos Capital? Well, Credit Suisse estimates it'll take a $4.7 billion hit from the fallout. Credit Suisse is one of its lenders and one of Switzerland's top banks. It was forced to dump over $2 billion worth of stock to cut exposure to the troubled Archegos investment. The bank's board has launched an investigation into Archegos losses and two top executives are already stepping down. Credit Suisse also suspended a stock buyback program and cut its dividends. Sorry shareholders. One short seller is taking aim at a Chinese crypto firm, eBank. It alleges the company isn't using investor money as it says it would. It sent eBank shares down nearly 13% today. NTD's Patrick Hayden has the story. 
Short seller Hindenburg Research said Tuesday that Chinese crypto firm eBang has been funneling cash out of the company with questionable counterparties. It says the company doesn't provide any proof of its claim that it is the leading Bitcoin mining machine producer. It also said that in its first secondary offering last year, eBang raised $21 million that it said was primarily going towards development. But around the same time, $21 million went to repay loans to one of the CEO's relatives. eBang debuted last year on the Nasdaq and raised $170 million. Hindenburg says eBang released its final mining machine in May 2019. Since then, sales have dwindled to near zero, delivering only 6,000 total machines in the first quarter of 2020. Hindenburg claims when eBang's machine business started failing, the company shifted focus to a cryptocurrency exchange launch called Ebonex. Hindenburg says the exchange appears to post fictitious volumes and has virtually no online presence, despite claiming it's one of the largest spot exchanges in the world. Ebonex's trading metrics are also absent from crypto exchange trackers like CoinMarketCap and FTX. eBank did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. Bloomberg reports the world's biggest money manager, BlackRock, is planning to do an independent racial audit of its operations. BlackRock is taking a different path than its peers on Wall Street. Financial firms like Citigroup and Goldman Sachs have resisted calls for independent racial audits. They say they've done internal reviews or taken steps to address racial issues. The reviews are basically deep dives exploring whether a business contributes to race-based inequities. Social justice advocates have been calling for these kinds of audits, but critics say independent racial audits impose procedural burdens on companies that could open up companies to risk of unfair criticism because the review might depend on auditors' subjective opinions. Also, choosing staff based on skin color could also be considered racist. Companies like Facebook and Airbnb have done similar audits already. A new study says that even as lockdowns weaken, many shoppers will keep shopping online. This could mean thousands of stores closing even after the pandemic ends. NTD's Colin Fredrickson reports. Tens of thousands of physical stores may shut even after the pandemic because shoppers continue buying online. You know, I'm shopping from bed at midnight before I fall asleep, thinking, you know, buying the things that I might need for the morning. A new study says around 9% of stores may close in the next five years. The hardest hit may be clothing in sports stores. I live in New York City, and New York City is one of those places where you just go see entire avenues devoid of brick and mortar shops that were there five years ago. Stores paid more attention to their online services during the pandemic. However, even with things opening up, shoppers are generally slow to return to physical stores. I broker quite a bit of retail myself. There's a plethora of vacancies. Uh, corrections and price discovery are still underway, I would say. It, you know, it depends on who you ask, if somebody's trying to sell doom and gloom or otherwise. I think retail is always going to have a necessary function. Numerous major retailers filed for bankruptcy last year, including J.C. Penney, Lord & Taylor, and Modell's Sporting Goods. The retail shuffle has been happening for a considerable period of time, you know, from the last five to ten years, but it just really accelerated from the pandemic. The only retail category maintaining their number of locations is auto parts retail. We see a large increase in demand for um, aftermarket or anything related to improving a vehicle. Um, everybody wants to get out and get ready for the summertime. Analysts say auto parts sales reached an all-time high in 2020. Although more people are buying online, many services still need to be performed in person. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. If a burglar broke into your business and damaged your property, what would you do? Would you be angry? Well, one restaurant owner in Georgia is taking a very different approach. He's offering the burglar a job. Entity's Phil Zo has the story. At around 4 a.m. on Holy Saturday, a burglar broke into Diablo Southwest Grill in Augusta, Georgia. The owner shared a picture of the shattered front door. But instead of getting angry, the owner says Easter inspired him to show forgiveness, 
He's offering the burglar a chance to work at his restaurant. You know, it was definitely the godly approach to the situation, you know, and kind of the, like the saying is, what would Jesus do? And, you know, would Jesus have the person locked up or would Jesus offer um, some type of redemption for the person? Wallace says he always tries to see the goodness in people and humanity. A lot of people make mistakes, but it's also how they respond and recognize the mistakes that are made. and. The story went viral on Facebook, getting nearly 10,000 likes and shares. One comment said, quote, Merciful and classy response. Continue letting God lead and guide you. But Wallace says it's even difficult to be a good person sometimes. It's condescending when you put your heart out there and you're sincere and you really want to help somebody. And some people think it's a trap or it's a setup. And, uh, and, and I'm, I recognize that that was done in the past from someone else, but... That's not what Diablos is about, and that's not what Carl is about. Wallace has 14 restaurants across Georgia, Alabama, and South Carolina. He says he often sits down with employees to point them in the right direction in life, and says he's willing to do the same for the burglar. No police, no questions. Phil Zhou, NTD News. The owner says sales have been up at every single one of his restaurants year over year. He's now planning on opening his 15th restaurant later this year. How are your swimming skills? Apparently the top paid lifeguard in LA is raking in almost $400,000 a year. Could be enough to rethink your career path, right? In today's Con Fredrickson reports. Government spending watchdog OpenTheBooks.com has found that dozens of lifeguards in LA County are making six figures per year or at least they did in 2019, the most recent year available. These LA County lifeguards are making a lot of money. To put their pay in perspective, the LA County lifeguards $392,000 pay rivals the salary of the President of the United States who makes $400,000. Seven lifeguards made more than $300,000, while 82 lifeguards each made over 200000 over 30 lifeguards made six figures in overtime pay alone. They're part of the L.A. County Fire Department and are considered first responders. So these lifeguards are actually Los Angeles County employees. And so they're paid for by the taxpayers of L.A. County. And let's face it, these lifeguards in L.A., they're milking their taxpayers like dairy cows. Most of the highest paid lifeguards were men. OpenTheBooks.com also found that Medal of Valor winners didn't necessarily make more money for saving lives, but they were still making six figures. We think it's outrageous. These positions are highly coveted. Every single year, thousands of people try out for the new spots, lifeguard core on the L.A. County beaches. There is no way taxpayers need to be paying this type of salary. The watchdog also found that lifeguards made a lot more at the beach than at the pool. The highest paid pool lifeguards made about $47,000. OpenTheBooks.com got their numbers from Freedom of Information Act requests and data listed at Transparent California. We reached out to the L.A. County Fire Department and various lifeguards, but no one was willing to comment. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. Still to come, a lock of George Washington's hair sells for tens of thousands of dollars at auction. When was it cut and where's it been for all these years? And Australians will soon be able to travel to New Zealand without having to quarantine. The move aims to give both economies a boost. That and more after the break. If you're like me, and I think it's actually most of us, then you're getting really fed up with the nonsense going on inside the banking system. I mean, we've worked hard our entire lives to retire comfortably. We just recovered from the crash of 2008, and it seems like it's about to happen all over again. Look at the too big to fail banks. They're only getting bigger as the Fed hands them trillions of dollars daily, while simple folks like you and me we're only getting the short end of the stick. 
That's why I'm glad I found this book called The Bank Failure Survival Guide. Give us a call and we'll send you a free copy with no obligations whatsoever. Just one American to another telling you about some options that you might not have considered. Call 866-239-2619 today for your free copy of the Bank Failure Survival Guide. That's 866-239-2619. The glory of piano masterpieces from the Baroque, classical, and romantic periods. New Tang Dynasty Television invites you to join the 2021 NTD International Piano Competition. Together, we preserve and revitalize the art of authentic classical piano music. October 2021 in New York City. Register now at piano.ntdtv.com. A lock of George Washington's hair has sold for almost $40,000 at an auction. The bidding started at $1,000 and ended after 45 bids. The hair is believed to have been cut from the founding father's head either close to or after his death. Washington died in 1799 at the age of 67, and Leland's Auction Company says the lock of hair is stored in a handmade glass and brass locket. It's been there for years. 2019, a different lock of Washington's hair sold for over $35,000 from the same auction house. It's a collector's item. And quarantine-free travel between Australia and New Zealand will begin again on April 19th. But New Zealand's Prime Minister warns travellers to be prepared for disruptions in case there's another outbreak. Libby Hogan reports. A travel bubble between New Zealand and Australia will kick off next week. New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern told reporters on Tuesday that quarantine-free travel will begin on April 19th for the neighbouring countries. She said that conditions for the bubble had been met and will give economic recovery a boost. New Zealand broadcaster One News said that the bubble is expected to run on a state-by-state -state basis and would restrict travellers from certain areas if there is an outbreak. The two countries faced mounting pressure from businesses to reopen borders. The plans for the bubble were previously shelved after sporadic outbreaks in some Australian cities. But both countries have managed the pandemic better than other developed nations. After closing their international borders to non-citizens relatively early during the health crisis. Australia has just over 900 deaths and New Zealand recorded 24 deaths from COVID-19. As the latest business updates for today, you can still catch NTD Evening News with Stephanie Cox at 6.30pm Eastern. For NTD Business, that's all for today. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. We have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.